Sciences. And welcome. This is amazing. I'm glad you all came. Hopefully this will be the first of many of these kinds of presentations from our department. And today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Michael Mapowitz. And Dr. Mapowitz did his undergraduate studies at Cal State Dominguez Hills and then completed his graduate work at UCR in anthropology with a major focus on archaeology. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Michael Mapowitz. And hold your questions for the end, okay? We'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. And then Dr. Mapowitz is going to tell you about an event immediately following this, where you'll be able to interact even more. So, enjoy. Thanks. Well, I may as well, I may as well announce it right now. So, after, immediately after the talk, there's, there's going to be a gathering in Digital Library Room 106. So, there's going to be... Uh, sort of a discussion where students can gather. It's in cooperation with the La Casa Center, the Latino Student Engagement Center and Pathways. So right across the way, um, if you want to join us afterwards, um, we can have a discussion. All right, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, my own research. So, I, so I'm an archeologist, uh, I, I, I um, have worked in northern Mexico and the southwest and west Mexico for the last decade. And so my, my talk today is going to be sort of a, a summary of some of the main arguments that I've made in relation to cultural change in Mesoamerica and the southwest and cultural interaction between groups over very broad regions. All right, and so more specifically, I'm going to tie this together in relation to the recent discovery of chocolate or cacao in uh, a Pueblo site, ancestral Pueblo site in far northern New Mexico. And so chocolate originates in, in Mesoamerica, the southwestern chocolate originates in Mesoamerica. And so I'm going to discuss uh, that subject in relation to my um, broad research. Okay, so when we think about the origin of, of chocolate in the southwest, there was a recent publication in 2009 by a uh, archaeologist named Patricia Crown, working in conjunction with a chemist, the senior chemist at Hershey's named Jeffrey Hurst. And so there is a, a very important archaeological site and, and cultural region known as the Chaco Canyon region of northwestern uh, New Mexico. And at this site, they discovered, well, it's long, it's long been known that there have been vessels, these sort of weird cylindrical vessels that are very unique for the for Southwest. Um, that, in, that we know from Mesoamerica were used for the consumption of chocolate, chocolate in antiquity. And so Patricia Crown, after thinking about this for a while, decided to uh, take chemical res uh, samples of the interior of the vessels and test them for evidence of chocolate. And so Jeffrey Hurst did the research, and they found that this contained theobromine, which is, is a chemical marker for chocolate in combination with caffeine. And so this idea of Mesoamerican origins for southwestern chocolates far outside of its region of cultivation uh, led to more questions. Where is this coming from? Where is this chocolate coming from is one of them. And in what political and religious and economic context? How are they engaging in long distance uh, interaction and exchange? Okay, so in far northern New Mexico, and I'll show you just a map in just a moment, this is uh, where, this is the site within that Chaco Canyon uh, region. It's, it's, so it's a, it's a canyon that contains a number of these large great houses. These deep, this is what it would have looked like in, in a reconstruction. And so within one of these rooms, they found a large cluster of these tall cylinder vessels. Okay, so Chaco Canyon existed at around 900 to 1000 AD. So think about the time frame. This is, this is over 1000 years ago. 900 to 1150. Now, Chaco Canyon, I'm sorry, it, it got cut off at the top here, but Chaco Canyon's right there, <laughs> basically. Chaco Canyon is way up in far northern New Mexico. If you think about the Four Corners area where Colorado, uh, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona meet, it's just to the south of that region. And so the question then is where is this Mesoamerican 
locale of origin. Who are they interacting with? Where are they getting this from? Okay, so within Pueblo Bonito, they found, within the Chaco region, they found some of them in a large caches. Okay, so this is an elite commodity w appearing way up in the north. Okay, so everybody loves chocolate. And so too did Pueblo people in the past. Okay, so this is a, a, a sort of a amplified version of the, those cylinder vessels. It's cut off again. But this is from Pueblo Bonito. So where did this come from? Okay, so this leads to four basic themes that I will address in the, in the ensuing discussion. Okay, so I need to give you a first a little bit of a background. So people have been thinking about, scholars have been thinking about this topic of Mesoamerican Southwest interaction for over the last hundred years. So both archeologists and ethnologists, people that study modern Pueblo people. Okay, so looking at the origin of material objects, but also shared ideologies, shared belief systems. Okay, so I'll talk about a little bit of a background. What is the evidence? I'll talk about a little more depth cacao found at Chaco Canyon. I'll talk about what is the political significance of cacao? How is it used in the source region, politically, economically, ritually, that may have been transmitted along with this cow as, cacao as well? How might this have influenced southwestern societies? And then lastly, I'll pinpoint the precise region where this is coming from and show you why I've come to this conclusion. So I'll show you multiple lines of evidence that indicate that it is most probably coming from West Mexico. So anybody know the states of Nayarit, Jalisco, Southern Sinaloa? This region between Mazatlan and Puerto Vallarta, that area. All right. So when we think about this subject of Mesoamerican interaction, there are four key regions, you know, the areas that I study, that are interlinked. So you, you cannot look at these cultural regions in isolation. You have to understand the broader big picture of how social change intersects. Okay, so Chaco Canyon, northern Chihuahua, Mexico. There's a very important site called Paquime. Anybody been to northern Chihuahua, Mexico, south of El Paso? Okay, so I'll talk about this, this uh, site right here. West Mexico. This is where I do my field work. I started out originally up here and then transitioned down into this area. So every summer, even in the winter, I go down and do my research. And this area too, central Mexico down into, through Puebla and Oaxaca to the coast. All of these areas after 900 AD are interconnected. Okay, and so the gist of my argument, why I'm arguing that these areas are interconnected is that what we are seeing between 900 AD to 1450 is the, the movement of a new political religious ideology, a new religious complex or, uh, from 900 all the way up into the Southwest. And, it, and this new religious complex is, is a solar related complex focused on a very particular solar deity who is the, the god of dawn, the young sun god, who wears a scarlet macaw headdress. His name is Xochipilli. So Chipili means flower prince. So he's a beautiful uh, sun god and who sometimes wears a scarlet macaw headdress. Okay, so this, the, where we see this guy appear, his complex, we see social transformation, major social transformation. Okay, so Chaco Canyon in this cacao is related to this complex. All right, so let's think about the broader picture. When we, when we think about Mexican or Mesoamerican influence in, in, uh, the South, uh, in the United States, we think about modern populations again. This used to be part of Mexico, the Southwest, California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Utah. Um, so there is a very rich and, and deep history of, of uh, uh, Mesoamerican influence in North America. Okay, so if we, if we go back in time, again, there's long been movement of people. So if you think about re in recent decades, economic policy that has shaped the movement of people, so the enactment of NAFTA in the 90s, again, helped to create this mobile labor force that moves between nation states. Okay, so uh, transnational migration, the global integ integration of economies, that has, again, brought people into contact, into long distance interconnected uh, social networks. Okay, so if we go back further in time, we can think about the Bracero program in the 1940s. 
So this is an economic program instituted at the beginning of World War II that brought contract laborers into the Southwest from uh, Mexico for two decades, many of whom were not paid fairly. Okay, so contract labor brought tens and hundreds of thousands of, of Mexican laborers into the Southwest. If we go back even further into the 1840s again, this used to be part of uh, uh, Mexico, prior to that Spain, so all of the Southwest again. And we can look at uh, these historical events, the annexation of Texas by the U.S., the ceding of a good part of uh, the western and su southern parts of the U.S. after the Mexican-American War, you know, the Gadsden Purchase that sort of rounded everything out and brought in southern uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Further back in time, we can think about long-distance interaction. The Spaniards brought central Mexican warriors to help to conquer the southwest in 1540. But what about before that? So this is all in, in a time period of written history. What about before we have historical records? Is there evidence of interaction? So that's where archaeology comes into play. Okay, so this is, these are Tlaxcalan people attacking the Pueblo of Zuni in western central New Mexico. All right, so again, this ties into the, the current national dialogue about migration, you know, and the movement of people. There's this, you know, we think about the formation of modern nation states. In the past, in antiquity, there was no hard and fast border like we see today. All right, so when we think about migration between Mexico and the Southwest, there are many corridors by which people move into the U.S. today. So I'm going to focus on a corridor of interaction along the Pacific Coast that is at the same time modern, but it, there, there is a deep historical tradition, tradition of migration along the Pacific Coast. Okay, so... Again, the questions that we're going to think about when we think about Mesoamerican and South Asian is what is the evidence? What do, we, what do we have in the ground that we have excavated that tells us that there was interaction? Okay, so we can look at the material objects and then I'll talk about that first and then discuss chocolate and cacao beyond that. All right, so there is some background. There, there is a long, maybe a century long tradition of discussion among archaeologists who have found clear evidence of interaction. So copper ornaments in the Southwest, like copper bells for regalia, wearing on dance regalia, was imported from West Mexico. Scarlet macaws have been found at that side of Chaco Canyon as well. These come from all the way down probably in Oaxaca, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec region. But we also have not just material evidence, but ideological evidence as well. So we see deities and ideas Showing up in the Southwest, this is a mural from around 13, the 1300s, that show concepts, so a horned and feathered serpent, a star, a stellar Venus-associated warrior, that are much earlier in time in Mesoamerica. So new ideas, new material culture are showing up in the Southwest. <clears throat> now, so one of the archaeological sites that was excavated that really contributed so much to this dialogue about interaction in the past is the site of Pakime. So it's also known as Casas Grandes, the Casas Grandes culture. And here at this site, has anybody heard of Pakime or been there? Very important site, one of the most important and enigmatic sites in the southwest and northern Mexico. This is a very crucial site for understanding these connections after 1200 AD. All right, so this was a site that was excavated by an archaeologist named Ch Charles de Peso. He was based out of the Amaranth Foundation, which is a little bit southeast of Tucson in Dragoon, Arizona. And he excavated this site for three years, 1958 to 1961, and produced a massive vol vol uh, eight-volume set of information that we archaeologists still use today to interpret um, uh, social organization and change. Okay, so this is that site of Pakime today. It is... It came into fluorescence at around 1200 AD, where there are these massive room block, sort of Pueblo-like adobe architecture, uh, beautiful polychrome pottery, some in the form of effigy animals and human figures and so forth. And what, came, what was before this was basically just really small, uh, dispersed pop, uh, 
habitations, like domestic habitations, and all of a sudden, within a generation or two, it basically exploded in size. Now, what we see at this site, so this is the habitation area, we see cross-shaped mounds, we see reservoirs, uh, waterway systems. We also get very Mesoamerican things, including Mesoamerican-style ball courts. So this is an I-shaped ball court that's very typical of what you would see in Mexico and southern Mesoamerica. It's a, it's a, it's a ball game. All right, so you don't see that anywhere else in the southwest, only at that site and, and the surrounding sites related to that. Now, what I've argued that is, is happening at this site, Pakime, is that we see a new religious complex. So that solar deity that I, talk, that I mentioned earlier, Xochipilli, this young sun god with the scarlet macaw headdress, he is central to that social change. When we look at the art of that culture in northern Mexico, we see that young sun god showing up. He's central to political and religious organization. He is known as the sun youth. That's the, the name we'll call him. Okay, he's the young sun, sun god. And he's directly related to this same god in, Mez, in, in Mexico. So he originates in central Mexico with roots, most probably at uh, earlier sites in, uh, as my uh, former uh, advisor Carl Taub has, has talked about, in Copan, Honduras, and Teotihuacan in central Mexico. So he's the god of dawn, love, sensuality, fertility, uh, the growth of corn and so forth. Music, dance, art. Okay, so most probably he was central to Casas Grande's life. Now what's unique about that side of Pakime is that they are the only site in the southwest or northern Mexico where they are breeding scarlet macaws that probably come from Oaxaca. Okay, so, so scarlet macaws are finding their way all the way up into the southwest even earlier than Pakime, but they're the only site that is breeding it. So these are macaw breeding pens. These are skeletons. So they had macaws and turkeys as well. Okay, so this is, this is a solar complex. Now that cross-shaped mound that I mentioned to you, again, is oriented to the solstices and equinoxes. So there's a new solar religion coming up into the southwest. So again, I'm just laying the, found work for the foundation for this discussion of cacao. This deity at Pakime by 1200 AD is still worshipped in the southwest today. Pueblo people today, 800 years after he arrived at Pakime, is still worshipped today. So this is how he is embodied in Pueblo dances. So this tall dance standard with this scarlet macaw headdress is that young sun god. This is that, the dance standard that represents him. So Pueblo people today are worshipping a deity that is, again, we can trace back over a thousand years into Mexico. Okay, so this brings up this clear connection between Mexico in the southwest and further south in central Mexico, brings up many questions. We need to look at the broader picture. We need to look at all of the pieces of this puzzle to try to write a big history of social change, interconnected social change. Okay, so we need to know what's moving, what material objects, where are they coming from, when are they, when are they showing up, and how is it getting there? Okay. Who are they interacting with? Now, some scholars have talked about the Aztec in central Mexico. Anybody been to the Templo Mayor in Mexico City? All right. They're too late. They show up later on the scene. Teotihuacan. Anybody been to Teotihuacan? Right outside of Mexico to the north, Mexico City. This is uh, the biggest urban society in, in the New World. They're too early. They're, they're too early. Okay, so one of the problems when we're talking about southwestern interaction with Mesoamerican cultures is that for a long time, archaeologists did not really know the archaeology of this region. They thought it was sort of populated by just mobile hunters and gatherers. So the name that they gave it was the Gran Chichimeca. So this, this area that's occupied by Chichimex, hunters and gatherers. So this is a rep representation of them, the Chichimex. You know, so this is the Chichimeca region where these guys are running around with, you know, their bows and arrows and they're wearing their skins and so forth. Okay, so anybody know about uh, Chico Mostoc, the seven caves of origin? All right, so these origin of, of seven tribes, with the Aztec being the last to leave. Okay, so you see this concept of this Chichimeca sort of empty space between the Southwest and Mesoamerica showing up in the literature. 
Okay, so this, this, Chichi, this idea that there's this Chichimexi between these two regions, the Chichimexi, all right, the, Ch the Grand Chichimeca. But in recent years, archaeologists have really begun to delve into this archaeology. So me and a, a, a handful of other colleagues over the last uh, couple of decades have really focused on what's happening in between these two regions. Okay, so we, we need it basically a transnational archaeology. We need to focus on areas, not just one single area, but multiple areas to try to find the bigger picture about interconnectedness. All right, so what is, again, the evidence? Well, what's going south? The only thing that's really moving south from the southwest into Mesoamerica is turquoise. So a lot of the turquoise objects and artifacts that we see after 900 AD most probably originate in the mines of Cerrillos, which, are outside of, which is outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So turquoise was mined up here, shipped down to the south, where Mixtec artisans of Oaxaca transformed it into elaborate uh, items of wealth and jewelry. All right, so again, so the mine turquoise shaped into these uh, little tessera and incorporated into elaborate objects, masks, for example. That's basically the only evidence for southwest to Mesoamerica interaction is turquoise. Most of the objects that we see in the evidence of interaction is from a south to north trajectory. Okay, so that includes copper. All of the copper in the southwest is coming from West Mexico. So copper needles, copper bells, copper axes, and so forth. Again, as I mentioned, scarlet macaws coming up from far to the south. Now, aside from objects, we have genetic evidence of connections between southwestern people and Mesoamerican people as well. So there has to have been long-distance interaction, the movement of people. So Meredith Snow, in a recent article, and her colleagues have argued that a, the, a southwestern culture known as the Mimbres people of southern New Mexico share genetic connections to people in Mesoamerica. Okay? So Mimbres people, known for their beautiful black and white pottery, this is like a, either a spider monkey or a coata mundi holding, holding scarlet macaws, they are most, well, they share some genetic information with West Mexican people, but also Central Mexican people as well. So there is evidence that people from across these regions were interbreeding and producing offspring. Okay, so people are moving. Now this is the region I, I'm particularly interested in. All right, so I'll talk about that in a moment. There are also oral traditions. So native people in the Southwest, such as Hopi people, have oral traditions, migration traditions that say some of our clans came up from deep in Mesoamerica, in Mexico, and even further south in South America, and brought with them new ideas, new religious beliefs. Okay, so these are Hopi people in northern Arizona. All right, so that's the broader picture. Genetic evidence, uh, oral tradition evidence, material cultural evidence for connections from the south to the north. Now let's situate this into the discussion of, of chocolate. How does all this relate to chocolate? Where is it coming from? What's the closest source? All right, so scholars in Mesoamerica have begun to focus on the significance of chocolate in Mesoamerica. So two very important publications by Sophie and Michael Coe and Cameron McNeil, an edited volume, have talked about the significance of chocolate. Okay, so by and large, this is an elite commodity. We see it in the iconography, so classic Maya, we're talking about uh, Central Mexico, or sorry, uh, Central America, Guatemala, for example, where we see, and, and, Chi and, and Chiapas, where we see classic Maya vessels with palace scenes where people are consuming chocolate, we see this later in time where there are marriage scenes binding uh, uh, women and men through the consumption of chocolate, so sealing the deal, basically. All right, so these are elite commodities. Uh, these are prominent in, in elite scenes, palace scenes. It's closely tied to feasting, marriages, alliance formation. The, the seeds, the cacao seeds, were used as money as well. But it's also closely related in the post-classic period to this solar deity. All right, so, so even before that as well. OK, 
Okay, so why is it important? What's the, what's the best part? For Mesoamerican people, they really liked the foam. Okay, so these tall cylinder vessels, we have scenes, palace scenes, where people are pouring it basically back and forth between vessels to get that frothy, delicate foam. This is an annular-based vessel here, later in time. Okay, so we're getting the idea of how this is used. What is the significance of it? All right, so now I'm going to turn to West Mexico. Where is this coming from? What is the indirect evidence that we have that cacao is coming from West Mexico? And what is the direct evidence that we have? Okay, so the indirect evidence, well, we want to know where it's cultivated. Okay, so we want to look at historical documents to see where it was grown in the 1500s. We want to know where it's maybe growing today as well. We want to look at the vessel forms. Is there any evidence that they were drinking from very special vessels? We want to look at the presence maybe of this solar deity that I just discussed. He's very closely related to cacao. But we can also talk about spider monkeys. So how did spider monkeys relate to cacao? You know, they're often portrayed holding cacao pods or seeds. So I'll talk about that. Lastly, we can talk about direct evidence. So I, I engaged in sampling of cacao vessels in West Mexico to see if we can determine if that residue was present on vessels as well in that area. This is, all of this cumulatively is going to tell us where chocolate originates, specifically. All right, so what we know about chocolate in West Mexico, at the time of contact, when the Spaniards first came, in this, into this area in the 1530s, they immediately started to document and, and take note of cacao cultivation. This is the furthest north that we see chocolate being cultivated in the 1500s, okay, at contact. And so this region is known as the Aztatlan cultural region. When the Spaniards came in and brought their mercenaries, the Tlaxcalan mercenaries, and battled the people. This is uh, Aztatlan. This is, this is a document from the 1530s that shows them battling people in the Aztatlan province. Who won? <laughs> you know, they basically drove many of the native people up into the, into the mountains after this. Okay? And their descendants are modern, modern people in that region today. Huichol people, Kora people. Okay, so this Aztatlan cultural region is key to understanding Mesoamerican and Southwestern interaction. Okay, so this is the broader extent of that cultural region. Anybody from this re region, this area? All right. And so this is the core area. This is where everything is happening. Southern Sinaloa and Nayarit. All right, so an archeologist named J. Charles Kelly in the 1960s and 70s really helped to define what this culture is. All right, so, but, but when we look at the material culture, it's in incredibly complex, incredible iconography, beautiful ceramic figurines, uh, lead glazed pottery from the south, beautiful shell jewelry, elaborate uh, stuccoed polychrome vessels in the portrayal of recognizable deities, deity of spring, the deity of rain, and also uh, 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 very fine obsidian tools. Before this culture came on the scene, it looked completely different. So there's a major transformation. You don't see any of this stuff before 900. All right, so this is uh, examples of highland Ostatlan sites, elaborate masonry. This is a site I excavated two years ago as part of a, a postdoc. All right, so we excavated it. it. Was a foundation or the foundations of a civic ceremonial center at the site. All right. Again, the foundations, the columns that support the roof, a private room in the back. Very different than the coastal Aztatlan sites, where we see massive earthen architecture. So this is a site right outside of Puerto Vallarta. Okay, so these sites that we're seeing on the coast are really important, particularly because they are located, okay, so Mazatlan's up here, Puerto Vallarta's down here. They're located directly north of where cacao is cultivated. So they're probably controlling the cultivation zones where the cacao is originating in the southwest. Okay? So that all of these sites up and down this area. So we know from historical documents, when the Spaniards came in, that cacao was being cultivated basically north of Puerto Vallarta. 
Anybody been to Puerto Vallarta? Super humid, super tropical, super beautiful, you know, but it's perfect conditions for the cultivation of cacao. This is one cacao tree that I documented right outside of Puerto Vallarta two years ago. Before that, in 2013, I went to a, a nearby town. This one right here, Mecatlan, right here. So really beautiful, really lush, suitable conditions for cacao, trees, and pods. So it's still growing in this area today. All right. This was first discovered, I should mention, by my colleague Patricia Ancona at UCL or the LAC, at LACMA. So it's still being cultivated today. It doesn't originate in that area now. Somebody brought it in, but the conditions are ripe, perfect for it. You know, so love this stuff. Right? You can't get enough. Because this, all of this information cumulatively, where I track down cacao being cultivated, tells us exactly where it is being grown today. And we can infer that into the deep past as well. So north of Puerto Vallarta up to San Blas. All right. That's in indirect evidence, okay, where it's being cultivated. We can infer indirectly that this is what they were doing in the past. Now, when we look at the ceramic vessels, we also get those tall cylinder vessels as well. Probably for the consumption of cacao, pouring for the, fr the very nice, uh, delicate froth. Okay, beautiful tall vessels. They're about 30 centimeters tall. We also get, get uh, other vessel forms, kind of these pear-shaped vessels that we know from the iconography from further south was used for cacao consumption. These, this is froth, really, this is a flower. It's the precious froth of cacao. We don't see these vessels before 900. We don't see these vessels before 900. People are probably consuming cacao at that time, not before. We also get elaborate iconography. So this is a person, this is his arm coming up here, right above his hands, is a portrayal of one of these vessels with from foaming, probably, cacao at the top. Okay, so we, we get a lot of evidence for it, portrayals. All right, let, what about spider monkeys? Who can guess why spider monkeys are connected to cacao? All right, they poop it out. All right, so their poo is a natural fertilizer. So uh, Carl Taub has discussed that as well. So this is really uh, a very unique subject because spider monkeys, we get portrayals of spider monkeys in this region far outside of their natural territory. The closest we see them along the Pacific coast is way down in Oaxaca. Okay, so spider monkeys are, this is their region, but they're showing up over here. So somebody in this area knows about spider monkeys, how to portray them, and what their significance is, their ritual significance. Okay, so in Mesoamerica, their, their monkeys are scribes, they're entertainers, they are musicians and dancers. So this is a monkey scribe from, from the Maya region. This is a, a monkey dancing from Chichen Itza and uh, Yucatan Peninsula. All right, but uh, as scholars have discussed, uh, Carl Tubb among them, that these are natural disseminators of cacao. So they eat the pod, poop out the fruit on the landscape, and disseminate these seeds where they, they grow into cacao. So they are bringers of cacao, literally. Okay, so here they are, a bunch of spider monkeys holding cacao pods, you know, dancing, portrayed on a cylinder vessel, probably for cacao. Monkeys here holding cacao pods as well. So this is in central, uh, southern Mesoamerica. Here they are in, in historic murals from central Mexico at the site of Malinalco, holding a cacao pod as well. Again, this has been discussed by other scholars. But I noted, you know, in these discussions that some of these vessels that we see of, of, of monkeys holding their tail and so forth, here's an effigy vessel with a monkey head with cacao in it. We see these vessels in West Mexico, again, just showing up out of the blue all, all across West Mexico. So they're holding their tail again. Uh, some of these on the back of them, again, have prehensile tails for swinging in the trees. These are not native to this area. They're far outside of their region. There are some historic towns that are known, or that are called the place of the monkey. Ozomatlan in Nayarit was recorded in the 1500s. So why? Why is this, why is this taking place? 
All right, so it's still there today, now called Zomatlan. Now, I'm going to tie this cacao complex, this spider monkey complex, to that solar deity. Okay, so this deity in West Mexico becomes very prominent at the same time that we see cacao, spider monkeys, tall cylinder vessels. It's a complex that is showing up, an entire complex. Okay, so that deity Xochipilli, the young sun god of flowers, is prominent all across this region, just outside of that region where we see cacao being cultivated today. Okay, so a new solar complex coming into this area. This is how he, this is one of his portrayals. This is a seated guy, got a crested headdress with tassels. That's exactly how he's portrayed in, in, in art of other cultures. At this same site, outside of Mazatlan, you also get vessels of monkeys as well. So it's, it's, they're, they're coming in together, basically. All right, so the reason that this solar deity is important in relation to cacao is he is the patron of cacao. So he's shown in some portrayals carrying knapsacks full of cacao seeds. He is being shown uh, seven flowers Xochipilli being offered vessels with cacao. He's the patron of cacao as well. And so, so again, so he's very closely tied to, to this cacao complex. He's also the patron of the day, Ozo Matli. So this is, this is seven flower Xochipilli or Xochipilli with the day, Ozo Matli, which is the, 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 the spider monkey basically. Okay, so they are closely related. So where we see this sun god complex showing up in relation to cacao is precisely where we see those monkey spider monkey vessels. Okay, so this is the area that southwestern people need to focus on for cacao. Okay, so that's all indirect evidence that West Mexico is really important. Direct evidence, again, I took samples of vessels to see if we can determine, in conjunction with Jeffrey Hurst of Hershey's, to see if we can determine if there's clear evidence of, of chemical residues. So I, I went to UCLA where a lot of West Mexico collections are and took samples of the interior, 17 samples total, four of which have residue of chocolate on the inside. Okay, so clear, direct evidence that people had chocolate by 900 AD. Okay, so what does this all mean? Okay, so what this all means basically is that as we see the movement of this new religious complex of this sun god who's tied to cacao, who's tied to solar worship, who's uh, tied to, again, the, the, uh, po uh, closely tied to political and religious uh, use of cacao, where he shows up in West Mexico is exactly the area that people at Chaco Canyon are looking to. So most probably there was some form of direct acquisition I'm arguing, between Chaco Canyon people and West Mexican people. So they're, they're teasing out this area, you know, trying to, trying to understand what's going on here. But later in time, this really important site of, of Pakime really seizes on it and runs with that complex. Okay, so, so in, in after 900 AD, there is this major corridor of interaction along the Pacific coast, binding these areas together. So there are people moving over very long distances, okay, all up and down the Pacific coast. Okay, so there's extensive trade, extensive exchange of commodities, and people are probably interbreeding, they're forming alliances through marriage to secure access to resources that are moving up and down the coast. So all of this uh, discussion about modern migration and transnationalism has very extensive roots that go back over a thousand years, up and down the coast of West Mexico. Right? And so this closely ties into chocolate, the movement of chocolate and the political and ritual use. Right? So people in, this, in West Mexico are still using chocolate today in this same uh, way. Right? And so that's, that's basically it, in a nutshell. <laughs>